Hi everyone, my name is Abiola Bello and I will be your host today for the Magical Worlds panel um, created by Waterstones. I'm so excited, so thank you guys for joining in today. It's going to be a great evening, it's going to be amazing, all right? Um, so just a bit about myself, I'm also an author, I'm a middle grade and young adults author. My book series called Emily Knight, I am, and I am in the Very Merry Murder Club anthology that came out a few weeks ago now. Um, in terms of questions, there is a chat button at the bottom of the Zoom. You can ask questions throughout. I'm going to leave some time to answer all your questions to the authors. So please don't think you have to wait till the end. Just start putting all your questions in there. Actually, the more you do it, the more bullied I'll feel to get it done. So just keep putting all your questions there. It's totally fine. So today we have Marissa Mayer's book. Gilded. Marissa is on today. She's going to be chatting with us about her book. We have Once Upon a Broken Heart by Stephanie Garber as well. And we have Beast and Beauty by Soman Chainani. So we have three amazing books. We've got three Americans on here, so it's going to be really fun. So guys, welcome to Waterstone Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are Thank we doing? How are we all doing today? Excellent. I want to hear more about this Very Merry Murders book. <laughs> yeah, it's an anthology by Farshaw and they've got 13 like diverse middle grade authors and it's like a Christmas crime mystery situation. It's very, very, very fun. The very that sounds awesome. Fun. I love that. What a great <laughs> it's really cool. concept. It's brilliant. It really is. But we're here today to talk to you guys all about magic, and fairy tales and all that brilliant stuff. So I would really love if we go round, we can introduce ourselves and just say a little bit about your book for anyone who is on here who's just like, I'm just here for bants and want to know what's going on. Give them a tease about what your book's about. So let's start with Stephanie first, please. Ah, okay. Um, my newest book is Once Upon a Broken Heart. This is a book about kisses and curses and the lengths that people will go to for happily ever after. Um, one of my favorite things that a reader described it as saying was that it is a stabby fairy tale, um, <laughs> which I really like. They were like, I didn't think there'd be stabbing. So it's about a girl, her name is Evangeline and she grew up believing and love at first sight and happily ever after in fairy tales until the love of her life um, gets engaged to another. Determined to stop the wedding, she makes a deal with an immortal, and all he wants are three kisses in exchange for stopping the wedding. But then after she gives him the first promised kiss, she realizes that bargains with immortals are never a good idea, and that he wants far more from her than she promised. Thank you, Stephanie. And let's go to Marissa, please. Awesome. Thank you. My new book is Gilded. It also has kisses and stabbing, uh, something Stephanie and I have in common. Um, this is a retelling of the fairy tale Rumpelstiltskin, um, but it is the story of Rumpelstiltskin as if the Miller's daughter were cursed by the god of lies and stories, which has turned her into a liar. She kind of can't help herself. Um, but it's also turned her into a really talented storyteller. And one night she crosses paths with the wicked Earl King, who is the leader of the Wild Hunt. And in this meeting, she tells him that she is capable of spinning straw into gold. Not long after that, she is whisked away to the Earl King's haunted castle. And he demands that she do just that. And if she fails, he will have her killed for telling falsehoods. Uh, and he locks her in the dungeon, and she doesn't know what to do because, of course, she can't spin straw into gold. Uh, but luckily, there is one person in the castle who can help her, and that is a very handsome and sort of mischievous poltergeist. And he offers to do the work, but with magic, uh, everything comes at a price. Thank you so much. And Simon, could you please introduce yourself and your book, please? Yes, hold on. My book is just out of my reach, so I'm going to grab it really quick, just so you guys can see it. And it is called Be Some Beauty. And it is a retelling of 12 classic fairy tales. Um, everything from Snow White to Cinderella to Beauty and the Beast to Rumpelstiltskin to Little Mermaid to Peter Pan. 
And my goal was ultimately to look back at the fact that these fairy tales are part of our DNA. Whatever culture you grow up in, whatever time period you grow up in, these stories reappear again and again in different forms. Well, we've sort of been stuck with the old Disney versions or these kind of sanitized versions for a very long time. And we sort of lost touch with what they're about. And so what I wanted to do with Beast and, uh, Beast and Beauty is go back to them. And as if we were in the 1700s with a crystal ball to the future, um, rewrite them so that they would find kind of the anxieties of modern day life without sort of leaving the period they were written in. And so for instance, my Red Riding Hood is about a town where every year on the first day of spring, the wolves howl in the forest, meaning that they call for a sacrifice of the town's prettiest girl in order to keep the rest of the uh, town safe from the woods, uh, from the wolves. So the town goes along with it. They'll send their most beautiful girl into the forest on the first day of spring every year for the wolves to eat in order to, for all of them to sleep easier and sleep better. And they go along with this until finally one girl who is marked for sacrifice refuses to go so easily, you know? And everything to then, you know, Peter Pan's my final story in which Peter is very much the villain. Um, and Wendy realizes that, you know, all along the pirates are far more sexy kind of uh, a, a, and attractive to her uh, than Peter ever was. And so she allies with the pirates instead of Peter and the Lost Boys. So every story sort of takes a big kind of dramatic twist. My Sleeping Beauty is about a prince who um, wakes up every morning thinking that he's been sucked of blood during the night. He doesn't know who's doing it. So the goal was to kind of find the subversive edge, the kind of dangerous edge that we've lost in the Disneyfication of these story, uh, stories along the way. Amazing. Thank you so much. So those are our three books. Remember, guys, you can ask questions. So please do ask it throughout. I'll make sure that we get your questions answered. Oh, I'll try my best. I mean, not promise stuff today. I will try my best to make sure we get your questions answered. Right, uh, my first question to you guys is, what was that trigger that inspired your book? Like, was you doing something? Did you watch something? What triggered you to write this book? Um, let's start with Stephanie first. Gosh, okay. So I think there were two, there were two main triggers for this book. So Once Upon a Broken Heart takes one of the villains from the first series I wrote, the Caraval series. Um, and this villain gets an ambiguously unhappy ending. And I really like this character. So I really wanted to write a story with him as a more central figure. And so Once Upon a Broken Heart is kind of like a deal with the devil um, because my main character makes a deal with him. And I, <laughs> to be honest, I think the big catalyst was... I was, you know, I was feeling very heartbroken. I was feeling very heartbroken, which happens sadly frequently to me. And I was thinking, what would happen if I lived in a world with magic? What would I do? Like, what could I do? What if I lived in a world with magic? And so it kind of gave me the catalyst to write this story about Jax, who was this villain that I'd wanted to write a story with. And I thought about a girl who was also heartbroken, who went to him and made a deal um, to save the love of her life. Um, from marrying this girl because in her mind, like if he's not marrying her, he's obviously cursed. Like clearly her and this guy are meant to be, no way would he want to marry this other woman. So um, I took the idea of her heartbreak and had her make a deal with him because, you know, I feel like heartbreak is such a common emotion and we don't have magic in this world. So I really wanted to explore what it would be like in a world with magic, but also with this character from Caraval who, um, you know, he kisses every girl he kisses dies. So he's on a search for his one true love and every girl he kisses dies, but then it's a bargain for kisses. So I thought it would just be a fun combination. Thank you. Um, Marissa, what triggered or was the motivation for you to write this book? Yeah, I feel like Gilded has been developing in my subconscious since I was a little kid. Um, I loved fairy tales and Rumpelstiltskin was always one of my favorites um, in part because I just thought it was so weird <laughs> and so kind of dark and creepy. But at the same time, it was also a fairy tale that I found very frustrating. And I felt like I had a lot of unanswered questions about this story. Um, I was convinced that the king was the villain. Uh, we have this king who rep repeatedly demands that this girl spin straw into gold, this completely random arbitrary request, and then tells her he's going to kill her again and again if she fails. 
And yet she ends up married to this guy and we're supposed to believe that it's like a happy ending. I also was always confused why at the end of the three nights and the king marries her because, and it's very clear in the fairy tale, the only reason he's marrying her is because she has this magical gift and he wants to be rich. He's very greedy. And yet it never comes up again. Like he, he never finds out that she's lied. And I, I just, I was so annoyed that there seemed to be these huge plot holes in this story. Um, and then Rumpelstiltskin himself was such a curious character. Like, why does he want the baby? Is he going to eat the baby? Is he going to conduct some weird magic ritual? Is he just sad and lonely? Um, so it, there was just a lot of questions, really, for maybe the last, like, two decades in the back of my mind surrounding this story. And last year, COVID hit. I was working on a different project and kept getting stalled with that project and just wasn't making any forward progress. And then one day, just completely out of the blue, this idea of a Rumpelstiltskin retelling in which the king is the villain and Rumpelstiltskin is the love interest uh, just kind of started to develop. But it really felt like it had been they're waiting for its right moment. So you wrote Gilded during lockdown? Yes. My goodness. And Gilded, and then if you lot don't have Gilded, I'm just going to just show you how big this book is. Just to show you <laughs> that. That is amazing. My goodness. Wow. Um, so then, could you tell us, because obviously you did kind of explain already about why you wanted to write this, but mm. was you watching like Disney one day and then was just like, this is stupid. Like, What was your thought process? I think it was that, you know, I don't like following rules. It's my my nature. I'm, I'm quite a provocateur. My job in life is to find rules that I don't agree with and then try to break them, you know? Um, and I think I've always been a bit of a troublemaker. And I'd always been told, like, my school for good and evil books tend to cross age groups in a lot of ways. Like, they're technically middle grade, but are they're also quite young adult. And then there's parts of them that are very adult. And so, like... I just love the idea of the old fairy tales, the way the Grimm stories were being for every age. Like those old stories work for every age. The whole family can enjoy them together. And so when the pandemic happened and there was this feeling of what is the world gonna look like when it's over? What do we write about? What's the, what's the way to proceed? You know, like there was no guarantees of, of what really there was to write about anymore. But I thought about the fact that Fairy tales will always be in our life. Fairy tales will always be part of who we are. And I thought, well, now's the time to try to write a book for everybody. Because if we're gonna, you know, the rules of the world are breaking, why not just go back to the beginning and try to write a book that's for, you know, kids as much as it is for teenagers, as much as it is for adults. And I'm not gonna categorize it for anybody. And we're gonna just see what happens. And I think that was the challenge to myself, was to write a book that would be for every audience that the kids would think was for them and then you know, be shocked that adults were reading it, and then adults would read it and be shocked that the kids were reading it, right? Because it was too dangerous, too much romance, too much edginess. And I think that was ultimately the inspiration for it, was to, to create that old feeling of the grim stories being subversive and intense enough for everybody. And I think the cool part is it ultimately bore out, right? Because in the US, it's published for 10 and up. In a lot of different languages, it's published for teen. And in the UK, this is the UK edition published by Fourth Estate, it's published for adults. Um, so, you know, wherever you go in the world, it's for a, a different audience, which I think is ultimately the proof of, of the concept I was going for. Thank you so much. I have so many questions, right? And the time is flying by. So I'm just gonna like really be selector at White Arts now. Goodness, okay, so. Simon, there's a line in The Little Mermaid from your book, Beasts and Beauty, that says, there is nothing more attractive to a man than a girl who silently surrenders her power to him. It is what fairy tales are made upon, which I thought just summed up completely. And what I found interesting about all you three's books is that you all have strong heroines, which aren't afraid to like face their fears, really challenge, usually like the male, you know, who's trying to oppress them in some way. And, you know, we know fairy tales, don't always work out like that. You know, they're always waiting for the man, you know, unless you're Mulan, they're always trying to find some man to save them or whatnot. But why was it important for you guys to show these really strong characters in your book that really just weren't taking any crap from anybody? Let's start, for, I hope I can say crap on what oh, I've said it twice now. Right, so Marissa, let's start with you first. 
Sure. Uh, yeah. So I, I, when I am first creating a character or I don't even know how much I feel like I really create them. When a character is first coming to me and starting to come to life to me, a lot of what I'm thinking about is how can I relate to this character? You know, what part of my heart is going to be in this character? Um, but I also tend to write characters that I myself want to be more like. Um, and so just kind of across my spectrum of books, we have characters who have skills that I admire and that I think it's so cool. It'd be so cool to be able to do that, or it'd be so cool to be more like this person, more brave, more um, resourceful, more willing to stand up and speak their mind and all of these things that I don't always necessarily feel like I myself would do in this situation. But man, I really wish that I could be that person. Um, and so I feel like uh, over time, I end up crafting these characters that I still want to relate to and I hope my readers relate to, but that also, you know, as we follow through the book, and as I'm writing them, I think a part of me is hoping that a little bit of them and their gumption and their grit might kind of rub off on me too. Um, and I do think this is one of the power th powerful things about stories and about books is that it does give you the opportunity to put yourself into another world, another character's head, another person's shoes, and kind of try on some different personalities and some different viewpoints. Uh, and I think that that is really powerful. Thank you so much. Um, Soma, let's go to you next, please. You know, I think it's interesting because it's the only kind of female character I know how to write. Like, maybe it's just who I am as a writer. Like, I think I always tend to write women who stand up for themselves, whether they're fighting for good or for evil. It's just uh, unapologetic women is, is sort of my specialty. I have more trouble writing men. My men tend to be quite weak and snivelly and sneaky and I feel like my women all, all tend to be quite brazen and, and um, forthright you know uh, and I think maybe it's just because that's my experience with women in the world and uh, in terms of you know who I surround myself with is I'm always sort of intrigued by um, women who are strong in their convictions wherever those convictions, convictions lead them, whatever, whatever path they lead them to. So in Beast and Beauty, for instance, you know, you have Snow White, who uh, in my story is the only person of color in her entire kingdom, uh, because her mother named her that kind of as an ironic jab at sort of this entirely white kingdom that, that um, doesn't sort of respect anyone who doesn't look like them. And yet, you know, she has no mirrors that tell her she's beautiful. She has no one uh, there to kind of reflect herself back at her, her own experience. And yet somewhere deep inside, she can sort of dig down, um, you know, and find self-esteem just inside herself, you know? So I think for me, it's more about that I come from uh, an attempt to have these women sort of be bold in whatever their wants and desires are. Uh, and I think that will always be the way I write them. Thank you. And lastly, Stephanie, please. I, when I first started writing, um, you know, I think like you get a lot of advice and I'm always looking for advice. And I remember my dad gave me a piece of advice and he's not a writer, but I was excited about writing. So he was listening to other writers and he, his favorite writer is David Baldacci. And he had heard him say, like, you always give your main character a superpower. Like, even if it is, and David Baldacci writes books that are, you know, set in the real world. And so it's like making them, giving them something inside of themselves that they're really, really good at. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a magical superpower. And, and that always stuck with me um, because I think it's true. I think the best characters, you know, have sat, have that superpower, even if it's not a magical thing. And so for Once Upon a Broken Heart, I was revising it. I'd written it pre-pandemic and then revise it during the pandemic and think like for everyone, it was really difficult and very hopeless. And I wanted my super, my character's superhero power to be hope. I wanted her to be hopeful. And I really, I wanted her to believe in fairy tales and love and magic and all of these things that like, I feel like 
I felt like I wasn't sure at first if I could do this. Um, I wasn't sure if that would work for, you know, this strong character, but I, I believe, I believe hope is such a wonderful and powerful thing. And I felt like, especially during that time, I like, as I was revising it, I needed hope. So I really wanted to give that to my main character, Evangeline, because I wanted like horrible things happen to her. That's why yeah. I said, it's a stabby fairy tale. Um, there's a U.S. edition of the book that's pink and it looks really pretty. And I realized later, like that it's fitting, but also super deceptive because just horrible things happen to her. Like horrible things happen to everyone in this book, but it doesn't feel like it because she's really hopeful and she believes um, in the story she's told. She believes in magic. She she has faith in people. And so um, that was what I wanted her superpower to be. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Stephanie, in Once Upon a Broken Heart, so Evangeline makes a deal with Jax to stop the boy that she loves from marrying her stepsister because <laughs> it starts very straight into it like straight from the get-go you see what's going on right um there's a line you wrote about Jack so he says he looked like a bad decision some unfortunate person was about to make which I just thought was so funny um I want to know if you can make a deal with fate what would it be oh if I could make a deal with fate um gosh that's a tough one because like I um, I'm trying to think, I feel like it would, it would end really badly, <laughs> but I also just went through a breakup like a week and a half ago. So I'm like, part of me is like, Ooh, yeah, I'd be like, Jax, help me find my one true love. Even though it would end badly, like I'm, I'm up for this adventure right now. So, you know, that, that's probably what I would, I would do this the week. A couple that's weeks from now. Bad, like, that's no. not a bad deal. That's not yeah. Bad deal. I mean, it'll probably end badly, but right now it's like, why not? <laughs> um, Marissa, so with Serelda, she starts telling these lies. And when she tells the lie about, oh, I can turn straw into gold, first of all, it made me laugh so much. And I thought this girl is so ballsy to actually commit to this lie. And obviously, as you go on through the book, you realize there's actually some truth to what she's saying. She's actually an amazing storyteller. She can kind of almost like tell the future. She has like an amazing, amazing superpower. But I was really surprised that the Earl King was really evil. And I know that probably sounds weird, but because he does so many things throughout the book, that's really, that's really awful. Like he erases Guild's family. He does the hunt. Um, he makes her order to do so many things. And towards the end, he's like really going hard on her about like, you're going to do da 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 da. And I was like waiting for like some empathy to come. And it, it didn't come with him. Um, but as an author, you obviously know the backstories of your characters. And I was curious with the Earl King and his evilness. Is it something, it, and this is just obviously from your point of view, that you feel like is embedded in him from like, the jump of life or do you feel like it's just because he's gone through so much stuff he can't help being this horrible and do you think if something I don't know what would be good for him but if something really great happened for him do you feel <laughs> like he could be less evil like I'm just really would like to know <laughs> um Great question. I will say, so book two, this is going to be a duology um, and there will be more about the Earl King's backstory um, coming up. That said, um, of all of my villains, I think that he might be the least empathetic um, or, or the least deserving of empathy and understanding um, in the kind of the, the mythology of this world, the dark ones of which the Earl King is one, um, they're essentially like demon characters that were like born in this underground, underground like land of the lost, land of the dead. Um, and they were originally created from like the regrets and the vices of humans who had passed, you know, over into this underworld. Um, and so really they, the dark, dark, excuse me, the dark ones and the Earl King started out cruel and wicked um, and then eventually escaped from this underworld. Now they're out in the world abroad. And I think that over time, the Earl King has just gotten worse and worse. Um, he's very powerful uh, and very vain. And there's just no one, he's never had anyone stand up to him and tell him that he can't do something. And so he just has 
a lot of power and a lot of control, uh, which is a bad thing to give to a wicked person. Um, so yeah, I mean, he, could he ever be turned around? Even just a little bit, like just a little bit of nice. You know, I, I'm gonna leave that as a, a question mark because there's definitely things that happen in book two that I, I think I want readers to interpret for themselves. Okay, okay. <laughs> he was consistently horrible and I was yeah. like what is wrong with him like it was just like <laughs> you know, it was a lot but yeah <laughs> um so then so with um Beasts and Beauty first of all the retelling of all the fairy tales was brilliant um yeah. I loved it I have two favorites um it would be Snow White and The Little Mermaid for two different reasons but Snow White I really love that you had these like racial undertones throughout that that book and I just wondered one because it's not it's not usual obviously for a fairy tale to, to go there if you want to say mm -hmm. um one what made you do that and two because you said your book is in positioned in like different age groups did you get any pushback at all for having that in that story I think for Snow White, I didn't know what I wanted to do with Snow White. So what I, I what I ended up doing was looking at the process I used for all the other fairy tales, which was, why was this told in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason Snow White was told in the first place was as a cautionary tale of what happens when the older kind of generation doesn't, doesn't recognize that at some point they have to cede life to the youth, right? They have to like a leaf on a tree they have to let go and make room for the new leaf to grow in right and you have this wicked queen who cannot accept that her beauty will fade and someone else will rise in her place you know and i kept thinking about well how is that applicable to modern life like it's just not so interesting because these days we have plastic surgery and botox and people hold on to their you know whatever they think of their looks till the very bitter end um, but I started thinking about culture and the fact that in our culture, sort of this, this predominantly, you know, sort of brainwashed standard of beauty and, and what we're sort of used to as, as the rules of being beautiful, that has still held on, no matter what, no matter how much we try to diversify and bring culture in, there's this idea of what is the dominant um, form of beauty in the world. And I thought, now that could be interesting if that's what we make Snow White about now is this idea of, you know, the, the sort of lily white kingdom refusing to make room for any beauty that doesn't look like theirs. Um, and I thought, you know, the mirror recognizes Snow White's beauty, but if Snow White has no access to that mirror and no one else is telling her she's beautiful, then she's like a black swan in a flock of white swans. And all the white swans are telling the black swan it's ugly, right? Where from the outside, if you see the black swan amongst the flock of white swans, you might be the one who's like, that's the beautiful one, right? So to me, that's what I wanted to do with Snow White was to really go to this sort of like origin of, of not letting a different form of um, beauty in, you know? And I thought that would be sort of a, a compelling way to retell the tale. In terms of pushback, I think a lot of my problem was solved by calling the book Be Beasts and Beauty dangerous tales right we literally put it like right there here because once we did that you can't really complain if something is too edgy for your taste and I also think you know the other thing with my books in general the school for good and evil books included is I am here to cause trouble and poke holes in the established rules and narratives and things like that so you know whenever if people try to come for me I always I'm always quite relieved because it means I've, I've sort of done my job and proved their point so um I think people who read my books have come to, to expect me to throw grenades um, and, and come to enjoy that, in fact. Thank you so much. Um, guys who are watching, I just want to remind you that you, you can ask your questions. I do see them. If you have more, do say. I'm going to go into questions very soon. I'm not ignoring you, I promise. Okay. Um, Stephanie, so Evangeline, bless her, is so like lovingly naive. And I was just like, this girl is just like, come on, like, you know, like, there was the article about, um, you know, when she had like the suitors in like the newspaper ad and she was just like not interested because she was just so stuck on Luke. And I just thought, girl, like you've got more options. What's going on with you? Or like, you know, Marisol, 
like you know who clearly has something like an issue with her and she just refuses to see that and I was just like why can't Evangeline see this like what like what is going on is it just she's just so naive or just really just hopes for the best in people is that just what it is well I think there's a couple of things I think one when you're young and you know you're 16 the love the first person you fall in love with it's it's so intense and I think it can feel like the only person you'll ever love um, and so I really wanted to capture that. I really wanted to capture that that intense feeling and also the way um, that it changes your lens so that you don't see what the truth is. Um, because I think it is so common for people in relationships to not see the truth of the situation. Um, and when you are brokenhearted, it changes your brain chemistry. Like when a relationship ends, um, you know, people, people do, um, I think the dedication in the book is for anyone who's ever made a bad decision because of a broken heart. Like it's really common, but then also my hope is that when you get to the end of the book, you realize she wasn't completely naive. She was right about a lot of things. And so I think the idea of capturing both of those that sometimes what can seem like naiveness to some people, like I definitely want people to be like, oh, honey, just let him go. But then hopefully realizing at the end of the book, like, oh, wait, she's not entirely wrong. Um, but that she was wrong. She wasn't, she was wrong about certain things, but not about other things. Because I think it's that idea of like, you know, especially with fairy tales and, you know, she's a girl who was raised to believe in love at first sight and true love and realizing like, having, you know, I really wanted to capture that feeling of like, yes, love is real and love is wonderful, but that first love maybe isn't everything and it's important, but, you know, like giving that perspective. So I think I just wanted to capture a lot of those feelings because I think um, love is just, I love love stories because I think they just give so much to explore. So my hope with Evangeline was definitely that people would be like, oh, honey, <laughs> oh just oh but then at the end realize like by the time they realize like what she's right and wrong about like kind of seeing the whole story through a different lens so that if you go back and read it knowing like the things she was right about and the things she was wrong about like having more empathy and understanding because I also feel like um I think in my own life there have been things I've been so determined about that other people are like you're wrong you're wrong and I think it's really hard to keep pushing forward when you believe in something and no one else believes. Um, so I kind of wanted to capture all those different emotions and, um, you know, like show that there there's a plus side to believing, but that it's important to also like challenge what you believe about things. Thank you. And um, Marissa, so in your book, there's a lot about the hunt. That's like a really significant part of the book. Um, could you explain just to everyone watching a bit about what the hunt is and also, because you mentioned that some people join the hunt willingly. As I kept reading the book, I was like, why would, especially after finding out how horrible this man is, I was like, why would anyone want to join this willingly? So could you just explain to us a bit more about the hunt and where that all came from, please? Yeah, so the wild hunt, uh, I did not invent it. Um, it comes from uh, a lot of Norse mythology, a lot of Germanic mythology. Um, and so when I determined that the Earl King was going to be the leader of the Wild Hunt, I did kind of a deep dive into researching it um, because I also, I had no idea, like I'd heard of it, but I didn't really know what is it about. And one of the things that I found most fascinating about all of the different interpretations, all of the different kind of stories and folktales involving the Wild Hunt, um, I should back up that it was originally, as I understand, kind of an explanation for storms, you know, when the wild hunt and their horses and their wolves uh, or hounds would come storming across the countryside and they would bring thunder and lightning. And it was, you know, one of the old ways to explain where these big storms would come from. Um, but then over time it evolved and you would hear stories about it being this terrible, horrific thing. Lock your doors, stay inside, don't go outside during the hunt because if you get swept up in it, um, it could kill you or they will leave, abandon you on the side of the road miles from your home. At the same time, you also have stories about it being a temptation and this idea of it, you know, if you do join the wild hunt, then 
You know, it's, it's ultimate freedom. You get to be wild and feral and have no, you know, nothing holding you back anymore. Um, and so you got these very two opposing ideas of what the hunt was. And I, I was really fascinated by that. And so just kind of took both of those ideas in as I was developing what the hunt is and why people are so afraid of it. But at the same time, some people, uh, you know, feel a really strong allure toward it. Thank you so much. And Simon, so with your book, there were lots of funny moments, well, I found it funny anyway, um, with Beauty when she said she will like kill the beast so she can have the castle, which is something I've actually thought about. And I always thought, why don't she just kill the beast and keep the castle? So Wonder, I like that, that you were first on the thing. same first way thing with that one. Um, Rapunzel not wanting to go with the prince because she's like, I don't want to live in the castle again. And also there's loads of other guys I could be kissing, so it's fine. Um, so it was, it was brilliant. But my favourite, one of my favourites was The Little Mermaid because I thought that whole book of that was such a read. I don't mean like reading the book, I mean like a read. Because mm. the sea witch is just going for her and just literally cussing her out for the whole thing. And every single thing that you know of The Little Mermaid that you kind of love, that like, you know she wants to go on the land and get her legs and stuff. And the way it's twisted, you literally sit there and think, yeah, she's so dumb. Why is she, why does she want to be doing that? But what made you want to do that twist? Because that was so clever and I've never actually thought about, oh yeah, like why isn't it from the Sea Witch's perspective actually? Yeah, because if you think about it, you know, especially when I watched the, the Disney movie, movie makes it especially clear, you know, the Sea Witch character does nothing wrong. She's not the villain of that story because there's nothing about her that's villainous. She is not the one who goes hunting for the Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid goes hunting for her in order to get help, right? You know, the mermaid's the one who transgresses. The mermaid is the one who makes, you know, all the bad choices. All the sea witch does is does what often the good fairy or, or sort of like the, the god character in other stories does, which is present a deal which should not be taken. And then the villain takes the deal in an attempt to, you know, better their circumstances and learns a lesson as a result and usually does, right? And in this case, Little Mermaid somehow gets a happy ending at the end of the Disney version. And of course, in the Hans Christian Andersen version, she does not because she is the villain. And so I wanted to go at this idea that she thinks she even deserves a happy ending in the first place. Because if she comes to the Sea Witch and, and sort of barges into her cave and says, you know, this is what I want, why should the, the witch help her? The, first of all, Aria uh, or the Little Mermaid is the daughter of the witch's mortal enemy. So even more reason that the sea witch should kill her on the spot, right? So the fact that she even offers her a deal seems merciful and kind to me. So, you know, all these basic things. And then the fact that, you know, she gives her a fair contract. The, the girl doesn't have to take it, but she does. And then once she takes it, you know, again, she's the villain if she starts arguing with it because she signed the contract. So to me, it became about a story about two different generations of females who both believe they're the hero in this story, right? And the entitlement of the mermaid to think that because she's after love, therefore anything she does in the name of love is good, I think is something that plagues our world in general, right? Which is if you're fighting for love, therefore you must be on the side of good. But there's plenty of people on the side of evil who fight for love in the, in the wrong way, you know? I can think of many a time in my life where I've gone after someone and used underhanded means in my attempt to secure, uh, to secure their affection. So, you know, I think it, it comes down to the fact that it's just a it's just a conversation. There's no description in the entire story. It's just dialogue um, between a hero and a villain, each trying to convince the other that they're on the wrong side. Thank you, and um, Marissa and Stephanie. So your books, I read. Obviously, I read, but I didn't know that you know it was going to end the way it did. So I was like, oh my, when is book two? So I would like to know. And for people here, like, when is book two? When can we expect it, please? Uh, yeah, so the second book of Gilded will be out next November. I'm hard at work on it, I promise. Brilliant, thank you. And Stephanie, when is book two out? I don't know. Oh, no. um, <laughs> I I know it will vaguely be out next fall. I think I was actually right before this just having a conversation with um, my U.S. publishing team in that 
early December, I think we're going to be able to share um, release date and the title, um, which I am really excited about. So it is written. I'm just revising it right now, but we, it's, it's definitely coming. Okay, perfect. Thank you both. And Simon, I'd really love to know what is your favorite story within that book? Um, God, that's such a hard question because I think each one I found sort of a, a deeper sort of resonance and meaning for me. Um, Bluebeard is the one that I think affected me the deepest. I think that story is so kind of dark and rich and has so many edges and layers to it that I think that was the one that I really went kind of deepest and darkest with. So that was the one that really stayed with me. Thank you. Right, guys, we are going to move on some Q&As. Um, okay, so you got Questions in the Q&A and questions in the chat. So I will just check the Q&A first. I will pick some. Um, duh, 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 duh. One second. Oh, this is from, uh, first of all, if I say your name incorrectly, I'm very sorry, so just take that. Um, this is from Delani. It says, Marissa, would your books ever be made into movies? <laughs> Um, I hope so. Um, right at this time, the Lunar Chronicles is with a new studio. This is the fourth studio that has owned the rights to them. Um, and they seem super excited. So fingers crossed it will move forward. Um, my contemporary romance, Instant Karma, was also bought by HBO Max um, to potentially do a TV series. Um, so nothing guaranteed, but it would make me really happy. So I hope so. All very, very exciting. Uh, Stephanie, so from Zoe Gray, she said, would you consider writing a novella or prequel for Legend? I would love to know the origin of his story, etc." Ooh, I, I never like to say no, I wouldn't, but chances are probably, probably not. Um, I, I only because I don't think, um, I, yes, I have a reason why I wouldn't do it. And the reason <laughs> why is also something I don't want to say because it brings attention to the reason, but, um, <laughs> cause there's just something about Legends Past. Um, and if you've read the Caravelle series, you probably can figure out why I, I don't necessarily want to highlight this relationship. So, sorry, guys. Okay, there is your answer. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so this person I don't think has read Beasts and Beauty. So, so man, is there any romance in your book? <laughs> oh my god, that's all I write about is is um, intense, edgy romances. I feel like that's sort of the the cornerstone of all my work. I mean, yes, I think every fairy tale sort of has a and not all of them, but I would say most of them have a uh, romantic edge to it, especially like Sleeping Beauty and Beauty and the Beast and Cinderella. And, you know, so many of them have this kind of uh, uh, romantic edge to it. But I always think that when I write romance, there's always going to be something slightly transgressive about it. Um, you know, my romances never are quite safe. Like, even if you look at School for Good and Evil, you know, it's about a schoolmaster who is hundreds of years old, who is in charge of a school, who takes the body of a 16 or 17 year old in order to prey on one of his students. I mean, it's like everything I do is like on the edge. Um, but I think on the edge is where you often find uh, the answers to some interesting questions, you know? In, the, in that case, what would the girl do? You know, if you're, if you're sort of being seduced by the most powerful sorcerer in the woods, regardless of how inappropriate it is, when she doesn't even know it, you know? So. Yeah, <laughs> that's your answer. Um, one, oh, I just saw one and I can't find now. Oh, okay. So Lydia asked a really good question. I'm really into like playlists and books. So she said, if you could think of a song that fits best with your book, what would it be? Can we come back to that one? Do you feel like <laughs> I can, so the first, and I don't know if this would change given a little bit more time to think about it, but the first song that comes to my mind is Don't Panic by Coldplay. What about you, Stephanie? 
I have two, I have two songs that come to mind. Um, one was very inspiring to me as I wrote, and then the other one I heard it and I felt like it fit the book. So the first one is um, the uh, the Nothing But Thieves cover of Holding Out for a Hero. Um, <laughs> it's just this much darker, gritty cover of that song. And the way it sounds, I feel like, is so fitting for this book because I feel like, you know, you're hoping, you're hoping for a hero in Once Upon a Broken Heart that doesn't really come through. And then the other one is Mr. Brightside by The Killers. That music video is is just totally the vibe of this book. And also I think it's just the lyrics. Like if you break down the first set of lyrics is coming out of my cage and I'm doing just fine. And I feel like that really fits Jax because it's like, really, really, you're coming out of your cage and you're doing just fine. Those things do not go together at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like the lyrics for that song and the way it feels so upbeat, but it's just kind of a mess at the same time feels really fitting to the book for me. All right, you so much. I mean, you have lots of stories, though, but is there any song that you feel like relates to any of them or a general one? It's interesting because we actually did this. Um, you know, for our pre-order campaign, I made a diary and scrapbook for every single story where I did a Spotify playlist for every tale. Oh, cool. Um, so I got to see if I can make that public. Uh, but basically, I went through every story and did a 12-song song playlist for them. So, uh, yeah, we did that work for you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll find out if I'm allowed to, to make that public because I know it's we gave it away to kids who pre-ordered. Awesome. I've got to say that's so impressive because I did a playlist for my book and it was like 14 songs and I couldn't imagine doing 12 <laughs> songs for 12 oh, yeah. stories. <laughs> Just because music is a big sort of part of, I don't listen to music when I write, but I just think it's a big part of how I sort of interpret things, you know, and often like I'll have a vibe for what I want a book to feel like tonally, you know? And so all my School for Good Evil books had certain songs that really appealed to me. But I think um, with this one, every story I wanted to feel very different. So it was almost like really like taking a sharp turn with each new story. Um, d -d 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 lots of people saying I love the bookshelves. Mm -hmm. uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. I feel like I saw one and yeah, hold on. Okay, Marissa, this is from Alison. She says, The Lunar Chronicles is one of my favorite series ever. Do you have advice for balancing multiple points of view in a way that changes over the course of the book, the way it does in that series? Oh boy. Um, I am a planner, I plan out my books before I start writing them. And especially as we were getting into the later books of that series, planning became a huge part of being able to balance the storylines. Um, because especially like with Winter, we get to a point where we've got like 10 different viewpoint characters and six different subplots and these people are over here and now they're over here and they need to meet up at some point. And it just got to be, you know, this huge jigsaw puzzle of a book. Um, and so I ended up like writing down on note cards, you know, what each scene was about and then had it spread over my dining room table. And then I found like little colorful game pieces and had one color to represent each viewpoint character. So, you know, Cinder's blue. So every scene from Cinder's point of view or that has Cinder in it, that gets a little blue marker and okay, Crest gets the yellow markers and blah, blah, blah. And in doing that, I was then able to like have this bird's eye view of how the story was flowing. And I could see like, oh, we haven't seen Scarlet for 10 chapters. I'd better find a way to work her in here um, and just make sure that all of the stories kind of you know, braided together really nicely and that we weren't forgetting about anyone um, as the story was going along. So that's a very technical answer, <laughs> but that is how I, I balanced all the plot lines there. Thank you. Um, Simon, will you ever be writing any more fairy tale retellings? And that is from Holly. Oh, like, like, um, like Beast and Beauty, like a sequel? I mean, yeah. fairy tales is kind of where I live. I think Marissa and I are similar in that sense of uh, this is kind of our main space, you know? Um, and I think it's where I'm happiest. I can see myself doing some other things, but 
um, I think fairy tales is kind of where my work will live in terms of like a sequel to Beast and Beauty, possibly. I mean, I'd love to see this as a TV series um, because I think it would be a, it would be a cool uh, series to make. And then, yeah, maybe down the road, do, do another 12 stories. Awesome, thank you. Do, 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 do. Uh, Stephanie, this is from April, I think. Stephanie, have the fates always been fates or does something make them that way? And if so, how did Jax become one? Ooh, um, so something made them that way. And I would love to tell you how Jax becomes one, um, but you'll have to read in future books to find that one out. <laughs> um, we've got one from, sorry, there's quite a few similar questions. Do, 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 do. Okay. Oh, okay, this is a good one. This is from Zoe. She said, what has been your favorite book to write so far? That's to everybody. So of all your books, which one is your absolute favorite? If you have a favorite, I don't know. Who wants to go first? I think it's tricky. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, I think it's tricky because, you know, we grow as people and we grow as writers. So each new book we take on, we're in a different headspace. And so when you look back, I don't think it's, it's difficult to say what your favorite one is because you know, the writing of them was the process. To judge them after the fact doesn't mean very much because it was where we were when we wrote them, when we were creating it. You know, but I think each of us maybe has, at least for me, I can look back and say there was, a, there was one that felt the most, I was in the happiest place in my life. I think when I wrote it was like um, the fifth School for an Evil book where I just felt I wasn't yet on the big finale, number six. And so it just felt very free and I felt quite confident in my kind of storytelling knowledge and wisdom at that point, having written four before. Um, and I just felt very kind of relaxed. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's one I look back with, with just a very smooth process of the writing. Yeah, I would say too, like, I don't feel like I have a favorite book that I've written, um, exactly like someone said, you know, they, every book had different challenges and I'm proud of in different ways. Um, so I don't, I don't really have a, a favorite, but definitely the one that I think brought me the most joy during the writing process uh, for me was Instant Karma. And it's my, to date, my only contemporary novel and I wrote it coming off of the Renegades trilogy, um, which was my superhero series, lots of superpowers and big explosions and people dying and war and revolution and evil and good and battles constantly. And I was so just mentally exhausted after writing that series and just felt like I need something where no one's in fear that they're gonna die. No one's being chased all the time. Um, I don't want big politics. I just wanted to write a really sweet love story. Uh, and so Instant Karma was just exactly the book that I needed at that point. And Stephanie? Yeah, I agree with the answer that I think I don't have a favorite book, but definitely process-wise, my favorite to write was my first um, published book, and that was Caraval. And I think it was in part because I'd never been published before, so I'd never gone through edits, so I didn't know what was going to lay ahead <laughs> once I finished drafting this book. Um, so there was there was this like naiveness as I wrote this book that it was like, this is awesome! Um, and it was also a book that I wrote was the first published book I wrote, but the sixth book I'd written. So I'd written five books that I hadn't been able to get published before that. And with Caraval, um, I was just like, you know what? I'd been trying to do all the right things with the other book. And with Caraval, I was like, I'm just going to have fun with it. And I had been told by numerous people um, not to write a fantasy novel, fantasy, oh, fantasy was going out. Um, also like, Caravel's not a circus book, but people label it that way. And I'd also been told, oh no, don't do circus books. Like pretty much I was told every reason not to write this book, but it was the story I wanted to write. It was the story that I was super excited about and super obsessed with. 
And I really just wrote it for myself. And it was the last time that, you know, I was able to do that because after getting published, um, suddenly my life got a lot busier and fuller and I wasn't able to just sit for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and write, <laughs> um, which seems like the opposite would be true. But so I feel like Caraval was really special to me because it was just a book I wrote um, that was just like all, all, all hope inside of it. Thank you guys. Um, this is a really good question um, from Katie. She is a writer and she's struggling to discover her villain's true motivation. And she wanted some tips to figure out the key to a good and compelling villain. Any advice? I mean, I would say the truth about a villain is if you think of them as a villain, you're probably already sort of shortchanging them. Um, whenever I think of a villain, I think of them just in the same way I do the protagonist, right? Which is they're after a goal and it's not my place to judge what they're after. Uh, I write their story as if they're just as worthy of achieving whatever it is they want as the hero, you know, because the fate is not going to put uh, a value on it. You know, I mean, the moment you put a value on it of, oh, like they're the villain, you know, therefore they're going to die at the end you're already kind of going to subconsciously prejudice the reader in that direction. So you really have to treat them as if they're the hero and have an equal chance of winning, even if they don't. And in my books, they tend to actually have an equal chance of winning because the villain wins all the time. Um, so I think that's the important thing is to give them just as much respect and the chance of a happy ending as the hero. Because otherwise you're just setting up a sacrificial lamb. Good advice. Do you guys want to chip in any advice at all? I think, I think my, like, this is on a very just like practical level. The thing that helped me the most with writing villains was reading The Fire and Fiction by Donald Moss, um, which is one of my favorite books on craft and craft. And he has just a great um, one chapter about like antagonists and villains. And he's really, there's something that stood out for me where he was like, yeah, a lot of villains work part time. Like they're not really on the page. And he talks about you know, I think of the villain, writing the villain in terms of like, what is their relationship with the hero? They're not just out there doing bad stuff, but I think of this character as having a relationship with the hero. And a lot of times they want the exact same thing. Um, they're just, the ways they go about getting are, are at odds, or maybe they both can't have this thing. But I really think of writing this character in terms of like, how are they going to challenge the hero? Not only by what they do, but what things do they say to the hero that challenges the hero? Because a lot of times, like my my heroines are very imperfect and they kind of need someone to tell them that. And I feel like a lot of times the antagonist is a great person to point out their flaws and their weaknesses. So I think what's fun for me is like, whether it makes it in the book or not, just drafting out conversations between these characters what would they say to each other? How would they challenge each other? And I think a lot of times if you just write these conversations, you can learn a lot about the character so that it's not just, you know, like what someone was saying by making this bad character who's going to lose at the end, but creating a different type of relationship with your main character. That's how I approach it. I wish that I had a piece of paper to be writing this down because you guys are brilliant. <laughs> it's all such good advice. Um, oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> no, I, I really love both of those ways of thinking about villains. Um, I know you hear a lot this idea of like the villain in their mind, they are the hero of their own story. Um, and that's definitely something that I think about when I'm crafting my villains. Um, it was fun with the Earl King, as we kind of already talked about, like he knows he's the villain. He's not trying to win any popularity points. He's not trying to get on anyone's good side. He is totally okay being the bad guy, according to, you know, this entire world around him. Um, but he also, like, he has things that he wants and he's willing to do anything to get. Um, and so for me, a lot of it came down to figuring out what is important to him, what does he actually care about and what will he do to get that? Um, and so just making sure that in every scene where we see him in every interaction, like, yes, Cyrilda, my main character, she has goals and she's trying to accomplish things, but I'm constantly thinking, yes, but what is the Earl King trying to accomplish here? And just making sure that um, I have really solid motives for him. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we've got time for one more question. I'm so sorry if your question is answered. I'm really sorry, don't 
hate me for it. Um, Maddie has asked, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? I think my, what I, I think is the most valuable thing I can tell you is when you're working on a story, if anybody else can tell that same story, then it's not the story you should be telling. The, the story needs to be yours, only something you can tell, right? Only something that you have access to in your own experience or your experience of the world. That's how we're gonna get something new out of you, something that's gonna, gonna affect readers and find them deeply. So really consider your story and be like, can anyone else tell this story? Is there anyone else who can do this? And if so, time to reevaluate. I'm gonna piggyback off of that and say to also write the story you're obsessed with, kind of going along the lines with this, like don't just write a story that you think will sell or you think other people wanna read. Um, write if you have an idea that you can't stop thinking about. If you have an idea that like, you know, you wake up at night or you just find yourself writing, you know, notes about when you're like out and about, like if there's an idea that haunts you and keep coming, keeps coming back to you, even if it's not completely developed, especially if it's not completely developed, because then that's probably going to be the story someone was talking about, the story that only you can tell because only you can develop this idea. So wait for that idea that is so powerful, that draws you so much, because also I feel like the more obsessed you are with the idea, the more likely you are to write a whole book about it. Because I think it's one thing to start a book and then it is hard to get to that finish. So you need to have an idea that's big enough and that you feel so passionately about you want to spend, you know, months and months and months of your life with it. And then years if it gets published. <laughs> um, and I'm going to add to that to focus as much on the journey as the end point. Um, I know, of course, a lot of aspiring writers have this dream of being published. That's awesome. It's a wonderful goal to have. Um, but if you are so focused on just getting there, just seeing your name in print, getting the agent, getting the book deal, then you're going to be missing a lot of great, wonderful things that come between now and then. Um, you know, it's okay to have fun and play around and take the time you need to develop your voice and fall in love with the act of writing and storytelling and creation and all of these things. It's not a race to get to the end point. Like, enjoy the process. Good advice, guys. Thank you. And just to round up this amazing panel, and obviously we've been talking about magic and fairy tales, can you let everyone know what is your favorite fairy tale of all time, please? Just uh, one. Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel. I don't think I have one. <laughs> I knew someone was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like it changes daily. What, what is it right like now? Like right in this moment or this week? Right in this moment, um, east of the sun, west of the moon. Thank you. And Stephanie? Okay, I feel bad for saying this because it is totally the Disney version of this fairy tale, um, but it's it's Tangled. Like, oh, very Tangled. Don't feel bad. bad. It's a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm like, a lot of fairy tales really are horrible. They're cutting off their toes. They're cutting off their heels. Nobody gets a happy ending, but I love Tangled because all she wants is to see the floating lights. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I just want to say a massive thank you to Stephanie, to Soma, and to Marissa for taking the time out today. Thank you to every single person that logged on, that tuned in to answer your brilliant questions. Please do follow them on social media. Do stalk them. Do send them DMs of all your questions. Send loads of questions to their DMs. Really get in there. Um, thank you to Waterstones and to Faber for letting me host this event. I had so much fun tonight. Thank you so much, guys. You. Have a great evening. Thank, Thank you so much.